Daisy Coleman's mother died by suicide. That's according to the organization Daisy and her brother founded to help support survivors of sexual assault. From having a loving and happy family to almost losing every member of the family, this is the tragic case of how one event destroyed a family. So how did this loving and happy family suddenly get shattered in just one event? Watch till the end to find out how it all unfolded. In life, certain individuals have encountered a dreadful hand of cards, and Daisy Coleman's hands were loaded with misfortune. Melinda and Michael Coleman were a lovely couple who welcomed Daisy into the world on March 30th, 1997. Both Melinda and Michael worked in the medical field. Melinda was a veterinarian, and Michael was a physician, and the family was doing quite well for themselves. They bought an old Victoria family home and worked hard to remodel it. They actually made it their own. Melinda and Michael had three sons, Charlie, Tristan, and Logan, as well as a daughter named Daisy. Daisy is the family's second child, and she grew up in the quiet and small town of Albany, Missouri. Daisy was a giddy little girl who had the entire world at her fingertips. But that would start to change when Daisy was nine years old and went to see a wrestling bout with her father and brother Logan. And, oh, did I forget to mention that the Colemans were sports fans? They enjoyed sports and were big supporters of them. This is Unsolved Files, a place where crime stories are being brought to your doorstep. What are you waiting for? Just hit the subscribe button for more fascinating and suspense-filled crime stories. Now, let's get back into this story and uncover this mystery. Sadly, they were involved in an accident on their way to the game. They went off the road and crashed after hitting a patch of black ice. Daisy and Logan were able to escape through the back window and were mostly unharmed. Daisy's father, on the other hand, was died in the accident. As you can expect, the Coleman family was devastated, but they finally had to go on without their loving father and even had to pass the scene of the car disaster every day. It became too much to bear after a while. The memories were too painful to bear, so Melinda, Daisy, and her brothers decided to pick up and start over in Maryville, Missouri, about 40 miles away. They kept their family home in Albany and rented a house in Maryville in case they ever wanted to come home. Melinda often stated that, while it was painful to go in some ways, it was also a big weight off our shoulders to be anonymous in certain ways. However, that weight would never truly be removed, and they would never truly obtain that fresh start. In the little town of Maryville, everyone is acquainted with one another and is aware of one another's affairs. Like many small towns in America, Maryville is enthusiastic about sports and football in particular. The high school football team even has a degree of celebrity status. At first, the family got along well. Logan and Charlie participated in sports, and gorgeous blonde Daisy joined the Maryville High Cheer Squad and won multiple awards from local beauty pageants. On Saturday, January 7, 2012, to be exact, Daisy invited invited her best friend, 13-year-old Paige, to spend the night at the family residence. The girls were watching horror movies and sneaking sips of alcohol. Now, this is something that many, if not most, adolescent girls attempt at some point in their life. The two girls trusted one another, and it was completely harmless. In Daisy's house, they felt secure. It seemed like a good opportunity to try some more alcohol. Daisy's older brother Charlie was friends with and played football with Matt Barnett, a well-known senior football player who texted her that evening. Matt urged her to come over as they were exchanging texts. He said he would pick up the two girls from their house shortly. Daisy and Paige were three and four years older, respectively, when Matt Barnett, then 17, was born. The girls crept out of the house at around one in the morning and climbed into his vehicle. The older guy's desire to hang out with them was something the girls found cool, even though they knew in their hearts that what they were doing was wrong. Daisy undoubtedly believed she could trust Matt as well, since, after all, he was her brother's buddy. Once he took the girls to his house, there were several other young men his age, and they were handed a glass of clear liquid. They didn't know what the liquid was, but of course, it was alcohol. Daisy drank it all to try and impress Matt, who seemed eager to give her more and more of the drink. However, that was the last thing Daisy could remember from that night's incident. The following morning, when Daisy's mom, Melinda, heard scratching at the family front door, she initially thought it could be a dog. Instead, when Melinda opened the door, she found a barely conscious Daisy sprawled on the front porch, frozen blue on the lips. She had laid there for three hours, wearing nothing but yoga pants and a t-shirt. Her mom picked up her daughter, carried her inside, and put her 
water in a warm bath. She found red marks on her body, and Daisy began crying in pain, and then Melinda knew immediately what had happened to her. Daisy was red and swollen around her private area. Her mother took her straight to the hospital, where doctors confirmed their worst fears, and the doctor confirmed that she had been raped. They went to the police to file a police report, and Matt Barnett, whose grandfather had been a leading local politician, was arrested and charged with sexual assault and endangering the welfare of a child. Of course, Matt insisted the sex was consensual and that Daisy was fine with it. She wasn't too intoxicated, he said. During the course of the investigation, it was discovered that Daisy's friend Paige, who remembers being only 13 years old at the time, had also been raped by another boy at the Barnett's home. It also emerged that one of the boys at the house had filmed the incident on an iPhone. The video had been passed around, and there were a few boys who had seen the video on the phone. Maryville Sheriff Darren White said he was confident he had compiled a case that would absolutely result in prosecution. According to the sheriff, they had obtained a search warrant for the house within four hours and executed it, ensuring that they had all of the suspects in custody and had audio and video confessions. In the police reports, the boys all admitted that Daisy was unconscious. She couldn't speak, nor could she move or walk, so they carried her to the car and they dropped her off at her yard. There, they just left her out in the cold like a piece of trash. One would think that's all there is to this case. Right. Wrong. Because of this incident, Daisy tried to keep a low profile at school as the police investigated Matt and his friends. But, unfortunately, because Matt was such a popular guy at school, people relentlessly attacked Daisy non-stop in person, on Facebook and Twitter, because they all thought she was lying. They said horrible things like how she should slit her wrists and kill herself. There were reports that the iPhone footage of the incident was being passed around the school. Mysteriously, this video had been deleted, and officials later said that the video could not be recovered. Now, for an investigation as such, one would think the video should be the most vital part of the investigation. This video in question had been on at least one phone, so why in the world couldn't the police recover it? All this while, Daisy and her family suffered vile attacks on social media from both kids and adults. At one point, a girl arrived at a local dance competition where Daisy was, wearing a homemade shirt that said Matt11 and Daisy0. Daisy's mom, Melinda, went on to say they started a hashtag called Daisy is a liar, and they tried to do a Twitter storm on it, and then they put Daisy as a slut and started a hashtag with that. Well, Daisy wasn't the only one getting the backlash. Melinda was fired from her job at the Maryville Southpaw's Veterinarian Clinic because they didn't want to deal with all of the negative attention. On the other hand, Daisy was suspended from her high school's cheerleading team. She began to suffer severely from depression and had even made a suicide attempt. Two months after the alleged rape, prosecutor Robert Price dropped all charges, citing lack of evidence. Shortly before this announcement came out, Melinda reportedly received a telephone call from a friend with political connections telling her that favors were being called in to ensure that charges were dropped. Matt Barnett's grandfather, Rex, who was a Missouri Highway Patrol trooper before serving four terms as a Republican state representative, denied using his influence to have the charges against the boys dropped in this case. And even though the evidence of rape seemed overwhelming, Matt Barnett was not charged with statutory rape. Missouri law generally applies in cases where a victim is under 14 years old, and Daisy was 14. However, if the victim is intoxicated, sex is defined as non-consensual under criminal statutes. Matt Barnett pleaded guilty to a charge of misdemeanor child endangerment, but not to a felony of sexual assault. He claimed that the sex with Daisy was consensual. Ultimately, he was sentenced to four months in jail, which was then commuted to two years probation. When asked how his office handled the case a year later, the sheriff said Daisy's mom, Melinda, clearly has issues. He also went on to say, we did our job. We did it well. It's unfortunate that they are unhappy. I guess they're just going to have to get over it. This, however, just sums up how the entire case went. To think that the rich and influential will always get away with their evil deeds is something that isn't too good. As soon as the case was closed, the online abuse at Daisy's expense continued. The harassment of the Coleman's family got so bad that they decided to leave Maryville to return to their family home. But the family home they left behind mysteriously got burned down. Daisy struggled, barely having energy to get out of bed, let alone to go to school and her practices. Eventually, her brothers convinced her to start wrestling, this time on their team. And because her brothers were on the team, wrestling became a safe family, like escape from reality. She really felt like she took back some of the control that she had lost. Daisy went on to dedicate her life to survivors of sexual assault. She founded a peer-to-peer -peer organization called Safe Bay to raise awareness of sexual assault in middle and high schools. HuffPost named Daisy as one of the 13 most fearless teens of 2013. Even as she fought tirelessly for others, putting on a strong face through it all, she continued to struggle with suicidal ideation. It was always an uphill battle that she was bravely taking on each day, and then tragedy struck again. Her brother, Tristan Ash Coleman, passed away in June 2018 from a car accident when he was just 19 years old. He was on his way home from helping his sister move to Colorado Springs when he was involved in a car accident. On August 4, 2020, Daisy's 
mom called the police to do a welfare check on Daisy as she couldn't get through to her daughter. Daisy spoke with police and crisis prevention paramedics for more than an hour, but she never really said or did anything indicating that she wanted to harm herself. Because of this, Daisy could not be legally held for mental health problems and she was cleared by the medics. However, just hours later, cops reportedly got a call from a female friend in the same apartment building around 8.30 p.m. that Daisy had shot herself. Daisy's body was found in her apartment that evening. She had committed suicide and she was only 23 years old. I know you might be thinking that this has a lot to do with all of the tragedies that have occurred in her short life, and you may be right, but there are a lot of strange circumstances leading up to her death. According to her friends, she had been followed and harassed by a man for months prior to her demise. On her Twitter and Facebook page, she wrote that police knew about her complaints of alleged stalking and harassment by the same man, which, according to her, had occurred since December. She said she was afraid to leave her house to walk her dogs or even just to go to work. She wrote that she was not eating or sleeping well because she was so alarmed by the alleged ongoing harassment. She said the man had shown up at her house repeatedly and pounded on her door. She also wrote that she believed he had managed to steal keys to her apartment and had tried to directly access her apartment. Apparently, he was also putting her personal telephone number in Craigslist ads soliciting sex. One of her friends said that every media outlet is blaming her suicide on her rape, ignoring that she was going through so much before her suicide and not putting any blame on this man for harassing her. She would rather kill herself than let this man kill her. Daisy had filed a police report the day of her suicide. When officers arrived at her home to perform a welfare check, she filed a report of stalking and harassment. This was merely hours before she committed suicide. After her death, unfortunately, the tragedy does not stop there. Melinda Coleman, Daisy's mother, died by suicide four months after her daughter's death. On the 8th of December, just hours before her death, Melinda started posting a series of pictures and words of her and Daisy to her Facebook page. She wrote things like, There aren't enough I love you. I could have said when I was holding your cold, broken, dead body. I held you like a baby. My baby, the baby I held when you first came into this world. It has always been the greatest honor and joy to be your mother and best friend. And then, on November 8th, two weeks before her death, she wrote, Albany wins, I'm dead, which was an apparent reference to the Missouri hometown where Daisy was shunned after her attack. On November 20th, she lamented that she had let her daughter down. She wrote, My heroic daughter, who saved so many and suffered more than anyone ever could, we failed her. She did great things for us, and we failed her, especially me. After she had written all these words, she voluntarily left this world, shooting herself just as her daughter had done. Of the once large, loving, and happy family of six, only two brothers, Charlie and Logan, remained. When they wanted to take some of their sister's belongings as a memento of her, it turned out that the salon where she worked had been robbed, and the albums with her exclusive sketches had been stolen. As for Matthew Barnett, his life is quite successful now. He graduated from a prestigious college and decided to follow in the footsteps of his influential grandfather. When Matthew learned about the death of Melinda and her daughter Coleman, he expressed his dry condolences on his page on the internet. What a pathetic story. I think Matt Barnett deserves to pay for what he has done, and Daisy deserves justice. What do you think? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this video. It won't cost you anything. Also, you can check out this next video on your screen to see the hidden truth behind a student's disappearance. What are you still waiting for? Go unsolve the case. See you in our next video.